Recording in progress. Is it recording? Yeah. Okay, so this is where we left off, and, and I'm going to return to this in a minute to make another point, but I do want to orient. Whoops. It's not uh, advancing. Can you stop the recording? Yeah. I mean, although the recordings are available, but I, I did not get time to you know what. Yeah. But so, what is the full form of CCM? Pardon me? What is the full form of CCM? Oh, uh, computational cognitive models. Oh. Better. What happened? Well, it's not more than Although I, I have claimed that we could do whole classes on any one of these points, I don't think I'm prepared to do a whole class on just this slide. <laughs> is it is it working? Is it advancing? I think Zoom, that's why. You are not on the presentation. Well, how come you're advancing? <laughs> It just started with. Okay. You're a computer yeah. scientist. You're supposed to have the answers to this. <laughs> Sometimes I. <do. laughs> well, computer scientists don't have answers for everything. Yeah, apparently, oh. apparently not. I'll, I think I'll, I think I'll be making that point today. Okay, so remember, sort of where we are in our structure. We talked about two quote natural language tasks that I suggested to you aren't really natural language tasks, and those were deductive reasoning and arithmetic word problems and i said hey there's a whole lot more going on here than just the comprehension of the language then we talked about mars three levels of analysis on cognitive systems we talked about the computational level where you're really focused on the purpose the algorithmic level where you're looking at the process model and then the neuroscience level we tried to help you kind of sort out the literature along those three levels of analysis to keep your lives a little bit more straight a lot of people get very confused about where they are i think mar was really helpful in that regard. And then we dug into the history of computational cognitive models a little bit. We started out with behaviorism. We talked about the, the problems of trying to describe behavior simply as a function of the stimulus and the response or the reward. And I said, there's stuff going on in that black box that really constrains that relationship, we're going to have to understand it better. And we went in to, to talk a little bit about what was going on in that black box. But I use that to introduce to you, uh, what was it that Laird called it? The common com computational model, which was sort of a framework for the, <laughs> for the basic modules of a cognitive architecture. And we talked a tiny bit about about that architecture. And then I told you that there are still a lot of people who are complaining about that common cognitive architecture model, mostly because they're concerned that there are specialized modules for specialized tasks, like, for example, face recognition, uh, social reasoning, social problem solving, etc., which sort of threatens the common cognitive model notion that Laird had suggested. And then in addition, I said to you that the common computational model kind of segments off the action and perception pieces to, uh, that are inputs to the cognitive piece. And there are people who are really worried about this artificial partition. I mean, really, the way Newell laid it out is there's this sort of cognitive stuff and we are physical symbol systems. We reason mentally about symbols. And then, and then there's this perceptual stuff that provides inputs to the cognitive system. But hey, sorry, not my problem, according to Newell. And that is exactly what he said in Unified Theories of Cognition. Um, and then uh, I, I said to you that there are people 
whoops, who are concerned about that partition. And I raised Barcelou as one of these individuals. And I do want to take this opportunity to make two points about this slide that I hadn't really made before. Number one is the importance of the cognitive science work that's going on at Edinburgh. There's fantastic neuroscience work going on there. There is fantastic uh, natural language work going on in Edinburgh. And remember when we met last, I suggested to you that sort of organizing the research base in cognitive science by these various localities will really help you keep your lives straight. And I know I mentioned um, MIT and I mentioned Pittsburgh in that capacity. I said a little bit, tiny bit about the Midwestern psychologists. I might have mentioned Colorado. Uh, we'll mention it again, if I haven't mentioned it already, where an important part of natural language processing work goes on. And now I'm introducing you to Edinburgh and you do need to pay attention to the folks at Edinburgh. One reason you need to pay attention is the article that Amit flagged for you, Andy Clark. Andy Clark hails from Scotland also. And there's a lot of similarity between what's in that Clark paper that Amit gave to you. I think it's a brain and behavioral sciences article. I had a look at it today. Um, and what it is that Barcelona is talking about here. But remember, the general point here is that you really need to think about cognition as surrounded by an environment um, and, and outcomes in that environment environment, actions that change the world, et cetera. And the, the kind of piece is sort of like inside here, in the, in, in the middle here. And one of the problems with the uh, computational cognitive architectures that I showed you earlier as a preview is that they really sort of tend to focus on, you know, sort of this little blue box here as if none of the other stuff matters. One of the reasons this is problematic in cognitive science is that this framework, this model suggests that the primary controlling factor on our behavior is not what's going on between the ears, but what's going on in the environment. And this is a not unfamiliar concept, actually. If you look at si uh, Simon's original sciences of the artificial, that is the point. The environment determines our behavior more than in almost anything else. And the concern with that from an academic perspective is, does anybody remember what the, the goal of psychology is? What did I say the goal was? I said it was established by predict and control. And now we are investing all of the control on behavior in the environment. And so this is going to mean that every circumstance that we study has its own constellation of environmental features and now our ability to predict, which is fundamental to science, is really threatened because so much of the control and behavior comes from the environment. Okay, now I'm going to, this is a good segue into this little section on epistemology. And uh, here I'm talking about how psychologists and cognitive scientists know what they know. <laughs> what do they, what kinds of studies do they conduct? What do they observe? There's another angle on the epistemological question, which is how do we as human beings know things in general and contributing to science? That's not quite the same sort of slant here. And I just want to call your attention to the fact that there are varieties of philosophical perspectives on, on truth, <laughs> on what it means for something to be true. And for those of you who are thinking that this is a totally esoteric line of thought, if you're working on the deception project, you really do need to understand the difference between objectivism and realism and functionalism and subjectivism and all that, all the isms. Uh, we're not gonna talk about those isms today. Uh, if you're interested in those, uh, the best place that I found to understand that stuff is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's fantastic for that sort of stuff. But today we're going to talk about how psychologists know what they know and how cognitive scientists know what they know, what are their various methods. And I feel like you need to know this for a couple of reasons. Um, first, you all do interact with human subjects when you're evaluating your technologies. And so you really need some kind of insight into 
how to how to do that evaluation. And the other thing that I am concerned about is that you'll be interacting from time to time with cognitive scientists who have a certain notion about how to evaluate systems, how to evaluate theories. And you at least want to understand how they are thinking about these problems, even if you don't adopt those methods yourself. So we're going to look at the primary um, framework for understanding human capability, which is the experiment. We'll talk about metrics of human behavior. And then I'm going to spend some time on qualitative and descriptive methods and tell you which ones are sort of favored and which ones are not. So your generic cognitive scientist is interested in this. They want to be able to compare behavior in response to carefully designed contrasting conditions. Those conditions are contrasted because they are theoretically relevant. They are based on some kind of theory that says, if theory A is right, in this condition, you should you know, perform like this. And in that condition, you should perform like that. Comparison is really at the heart of um, behavioral science, in my experience. So you might look at situations that you think are more or less cognitively demanding, more or less detectable, more or less understandable, et cetera. And the reason that we do this is that we want to be able to claim causality. So if we see a difference in behavior that was anticipated in advance in the experiment, then we say that whatever the difference was in the experimental conditions caused the outcome. And you don't get to do that when you are in a purely descriptive situation, when you have not set up a priori hypotheses about the expected differences between those conditions. Um, so you assume that the condition, and this is a critical problem here, you assume that the condition that you built into your experiment, you know, low light, uh, you know, uh, high, high illumination, uh, um, you know, low level sound, um, high level sound, uh, highly meaningful, not so meaningful, uh, negative affect, positive affect. You're assuming that that is the thing that is responsible for whatever it is that you're measuring when you get a difference in the measurements. And you are not assuming, you are not anticipating the possibility that it is the interaction of those manipulations in the context of the static common conditions in which you are running your experiment. So to carry this sort of to the extreme, uh, if I were to test the effect of, you know, I don't know what the lighting in, in this room on your ability to do, I don't know what to take notes or whatever, um, I would be assuming that it is the effect of the lighting manipulation and not so much the effect of the lighting manipulation in the presence of, let's say, all these people or this thing on the screen here. Now, typically, we do worry about designing the task setting, the thing that is held constant, to make sure that we don't have those interactions. But the one thing that we cannot control very well is the effect of the social environment on the experimental outcomes. And so you get a problem in all experiments associated with something we call the task demands and the task demand setting. Um, I was just talking the other day uh, with my colleagues in um, Maryland where we do the surgical work and they were saying that they were really having a hard time getting the participants in that experiment, these are medics who are learning to do surgical procedures, getting them to think aloud, to tell us what they're thinking about while they're executing these surgical procedures. And I said, gosh, you know, there you guys are with your clipboards <laughs> and lights shining down upon them. And there's all these doctors that are observing them. The demand characteristics are going to be influencing their performance and you want to get rid of that problem. And this in general, is 
um, a, a huge problem for all of the experimental literature. For example, when we try to understand mathematical competence, for example, how people solve those little word problems that I was talking to you about earlier, when we try to understand that and we look at that in the context of a classroom and you know, paper and pencil test, we're gonna get one set of conclusions. When you take that very same type of problem and you put it, for example, in the supermarket and you measure performance, you get a very different impression about mathematical competence. So you do really want to be aware, especially of the uh, social demand characteristics. And that is very threatening to this predict and control goal that we have. Um, OK, here's a topic that I definitely want to raise for you guys, because it does seem to be something you're concerned about. Um, are individual differences a viable experimental condition? Do, do people, do research psychologists care about, um, you know, the effect of conscientiousness and your degree of conscientiousness on your math problem solving processes, let's just say? Well, kind of, there is a community that, that worries a little bit about that kind of thing. But in general, the problem of individual differences is that it has too many parameters. I don't even know how many parameters they're thinking. I mean, there's sort of the big five kind of thing that governs most of the thought in, in this area. But, but really, the, the, the space and, and range of individual differences is just too big for most of the cognitive science folks to feel like we're going to get a predict and control theory out of that. That's the problem. Even, even if I could measure those things, am I ever going to be in a situation where I'm going to measure you know, your personality characteristics in a given problem solving situation or a given team activity or whatever and, and predict your behavior? Probably not. I'm just not going to be able to get that prediction control handle on things. What do we look at in individual differences that makes us feel like we're still pursuing science and not noise? Um, well, we do look at development and aging. We will look at you know, how little kids at various ages will perform uh, language processing tasks, reasoning tasks, causal reasoning. We'll look at the effect of your age group versus my age group on things like short-term memory capacity and episodic memory. We will do that. So we tend to look at development and aging as a theoretically um, informative contrast in individual differences. We will look at neurological compromise. We will look at cultural background. And we will look at expertise, and expertise is the one that I happen to look at. So, you know, how does a biologist think about a situation uh, versus an untrained, uh, um, you know, like undergraduate? Um, how does a doctor think about something versus how does a, a, a public health person think about something? We will look at the effect of expertise. But remember what I said to you when I talked to you about the the foundations of this computational cognitive architecture notion. I said the idea was to pull out the constancies in our thinking equipment independent of the knowledge. I said, you know, the whole roots of this movement came from experiments where we worked on nonsense syllables and the effect of, you know, learning long lists over time and forgetting and repetition and all that sort of stuff where the content was meaningless on purpose because we were interested in a theory about the cognitive architecture. So once you, certainly once you start getting into the expertise area, you have a risk of participating in the research community as a quote applied person meaning not as good as a real solid basic researcher Amitabha did you want to make okay, I would have learned something from it yeah. okay 
So I, I you know, I, I did some work on this personality as well as an exception. And, and you also, you know, said that, you know, people don't like it. And you mentioned about conscience. So I believe the big five model people, psychologists who don't believe it, they say, it's a model very, you know, shallow. I mean, you can find out this behavior quite easily, but they don't tell you something detailed about the person mm -hmm. at all. But the interesting point you mentioned, conscientiousness, is about what? Like, it's about your math solving ability or about your engineer life or driving or blah, blah. Exactly. So that's the way people do Because Swartz, I mean, the paper, did not talk about that. So I want to learn. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't know because I don't do this. Although I would say there are people in my department who do this. Okay. Um, and it does, it slips into applied psychology. Um, yeah, fairly reputable applied psychology. There's a journal called the Journal of Applied Psychology. What a surprise. Um, and it is uh, very theoretically oriented and very mathematically oriented, but it's still in the bin of applied psychology. Your point, I think, is really well taken. Conscientious in what capacity? Okay, so now if I have conscientiousness for, for Valerie as a driver versus, and I am, um, but and conscientiousness for Valerie as a lecturer, I am. Uh, conscientiousness for Valerie in terms of, uh, I don't know, bargain shopping, maybe not so much, right? Okay, so now, so the, what did I have? Like, I've, now I've got three parameters. Okay, now multiply that <laughs> over all the dimensions of my existence, and you end up with too many parameters that need to be determined in order to what? Predict and control. And so, so you know, most psychologists, many psychologists and many cognitive scientists are like, they just throw up their hands. <clears throat> We're not going there. <laughs> Yeah. Michael Posner was consulting. On um, yeah. conscientiousness? Yeah. Is he? There was one study, I was reviewing this paper. Mm -hmm. so there was one study when, uh, study when he is trying to analyze what is happening when people are driving and using the mobile simultaneously. Okay. So it's it's been long said that don't use your mobile. It's oh. been, Oh yeah. Yeah. So our parents also say that don't use mobile yeah. driving. So they have this study while so in that study, this point came up. Yeah. Um I I I would imagine that when Posner dug into this, first of all, he was looking at it from a neuroscience perspective, I would guess, um, which would be the low level mark stuff. Um and and I would also guess that he was talking about it from an attention and yes, attention, attention management perspective. And uh, for respect to neuroscience stuff. Carl Piston work on causality. Mm -hmm. So he works on uh, understanding the neuronal level, how this happens, mm -hmm. and try to understand uh, the, these like causal <coughs> happenings in the brain or mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. So, but again, that's at that low level neurosciency level. And remember, at the very least, you want to be able to converge the neuroscience explanation with the next layer up, which is the behavioral Yeah, like level. the psychology. Yeah, level. the psychological level. So we're not really, we're not really making progress unless, <clears throat> unless we can make that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that line. That's what I would say. Um, so, you know, these are some things that are fairly well respected um, in terms of their potential for contributing to basic psychological and cognitive theory. I've worked in the area of expertise. I have, I have studied doctors in particular and pilots and all, all kinds of people actually. And it, it has been a tough road to make my views on the nature of expertise clear to the basic research community. But you know, Ahmed always said, don't do what everybody else is doing go someplace else. And that is where I've gone. And I finally, finally, finally cracked uh, the Journal of Expertise, um, which is a premier journal covering this topic. Um, this year, it just came out uh, on, on the importance of, um, of, of goal reasoning in, in expertise. Okay, so apart from, apart from these, which are sort of fairly standard, this sort of multi-dimensional, you know, personality characteristics 
are a little bit squishy in, in most mainstream cognitive science. There are pockets of respectability, but in general, especially um, sort of your basic experimental psychologists, they're like, I don't think so. Um, okay, uh, otherwise individual differences are called noise. And the idea is that your understanding of big effects on cognition, reasoning, perception, et cetera, actually are so big as to leap over these individual differences and these things that are called noise. And that's really the basic basics of statistical analysis. Uh, be aware that the, the hurdle of noise, just because of the way that we do statistics, shrinks with the increasing number of observations. And so one of the problems, you're nodding, you've heard this before, one of the problems with some of the big data work is that you have so much data, virtually any comparison that you make looks statistically significant. Um, analysis in, in this kind of experimental <coughs> framework where you're making contrasts uh, can be really tricky. My advice, and this is not the first time I'm gonna say something like this, um, the issue is how you, how you distribute your different experimental conditions over participants, go get help from Christian. He knows what he's doing. Suppose, suppose, I'm going to give you a trivial example. Suppose I were interested in, I don't know what, your attention span in the presence of different lighting conditions and different levels of background noise. Let's just say, okay? Well, I could have you do all four combinations. Let's say there's two levels of each. I could do, have you do all four combinations. I could have you do just one combination. So how you distribute those combinations of experimental conditions affects how you do this statistical analysis. And, um, you know, I, I've taught this stuff before. Certainly, you know, I've said this before. Almost any bullet in this series of lectures could go into an entire course, not a class, but an entire course. And that one, probably goes into like three courses. <laughs> so, so obviously we're not gonna cover that here. But I, I, I give this to you um, to help you appreciate how your generic cognitive scientist is going to be thinking about what is important and some guidelines on um, investigating important questions and and setting up experimental contrast that's your your generic cognitive scientist is going to be thinking like that okay metrics so you're interested in this silly experiment that i've just described to you about lighting and sound and you know the effect on attention or i don't know what some some vigilance thing um how am i going to measure your performance. Well, I need something called a metric. And the point that I want to make is that every legitimate metric that is accepted as um, evidence regarding the effect of some experimental manipulation has a theory behind it. We don't, pardon me? <laughs> has a theory behind it. So response time, as I've talked to you previously about this notion that we're limited serial uh, uh, processors, response time tells you something about the complexity of the cognitive activity. Uh, memory accuracy tells you something about storage, representation, and retrieval processes. Uh, forced choice tells you something about the sensitivity of your observer to the ability to compare two situations. Um, eye movements supposedly reflect attention. What did Poser say about that the last time that we met? Do you guys remember? Eye movements? Yeah, what did he say? So they you guys are analyzing it from the MRI mm -hmm. and they are very important when they are doing certain experiments like when, where they are looking mm -hmm. and it depends on the environment. Yeah, but, but there was a great big but in that. Guys, remember the but? 
He had always been working with the assumption that eye movements and saccades were slayed, were tethered to attentional processes. And it was only when he looked it at the fMRI, or I think it was fMRI data, some kind of um, uh, neuroscience measure, that he realized that it was possible to change your focus of attention internally and not have that be mirrored with the eyes. So anybody who's doing eye movement stuff, you want to be aware of that potential problem. And that was a 2009 video, 2010 video. So that's a pretty old. So that means we are saying people are looking at something, but not of it. Okay, not yeah, bigger. you can't, you, I mean, it's a, it's a heuristic, but I can look at that thing that says aging in brain cohort, and I'm thinking, what question is Amitabha going to ask next, which is just down here, my peripheral vision, even though I'm looking there. So you cannot see that eye moments reflected. You should be cautious about that. Yeah. And uh, while evaluating, how did they, um, how did they detect where the attention was? Uh, in comparison to where the eye was looking at? I, I don't know the details of that. I just know the poster mentioned it in the in the video okay. that he'd always been assuming that, that I, I imagine. Yeah, I'll answer that question. Okay. How do so whenever they check the fMRI, there is an activation map. Uh -huh. If people are not looking in the direction, but it will be reflected in their activation map, they like what they are looking at. Okay, so basically they are comparing uh, the fMRI and the eye movement tracker to see if they are paying attention to the same place. Yes, and if I am looking at let's say laptop, so there will be an activation map in my uh, brain like I am looking at laptop. Mm -hmm. So like uh, from a psychology perspective, I will say that there is first sense sensation and then it moves to perception, I guess. Mm -hmm. So until and unless we don't have sensation, we cannot do perception and there is a no activation map. So there is first a thing or object in front of us, which we are looking at, then it will create an activation map, which can be analyzed at what objects you are looking at. But you can see activation yeah. that is not tethered to an eye movement. That's if you want if, if yeah. a practical example of this, um, so sometimes you'll see people who want to, they want to understand how do people, um, you know, you're reading a passage, how do you know what you're reading? Like, how do you understand the text? And you'll find some, you know, sometimes you'll come across people who are like, well, our participants spend more time looking at, you know, this particular word. Um, the interesting thing here, though, is that um, there is, so there's a tendency for you to spend more time looking at rare words um just in general and so if you're just saying you know my participants spent more time looking at this word uh you need to correct for word frequency so you know it doesn't necessarily i mean there, there's some part that is relevant to the attentional processing but you can't assume a one-to-one -one mapping right. between cognitive demand and where you're looking mm -hmm. really is the right um there's another uh kind of metric called the think aloud protocol i use these all the time uh and this is something like um so i'm looking at this baked plant wondering how it got there and she isn't it ugly and whatever okay so that's <laughs> that would be a think aloud protocol uh typically it would be directed towards some problem solving act activity so uh you're doing surgery and you know okay now i am in the process of marking my incision and then I'm going to make the incision, and then I am, uh, I don't know what, separating the fat. We like for a think aloud protocol, and this is very important. We like for a think aloud protocol to be concurrent with performing the task. It's not something that you do to describe what you will do. It's not a post hoc explanation of what you did, it is a concurrent account, a running account of what you are thinking about as you are solving the task or performing the activity. And the idea is that there's something which we will talk about called working memory. And the think aloud protocol is just sort of a dump of all the stuff that is in your working memory. Any other use of language is not that, it's something else. 
Um, okay. And here I want to raise the sensitive topic of focus groups and focus group <clears throat> opinion. What do you learn about in, let's say, the consensus opinion of a focus group? And for that, I have a really important old video. Not that one. <laughs> it's, it's called Ash. That, that is the one. Well, okay. I think that yes. <laughs> no, this is this is a very old social psychology experiment. Okay, so that is very evident still if that guy is giving wrong answer. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate um, thing about being a human being as a social creature. Well, I, I I actually I actually don't view it as unfortunate. I just think that we don't use that kind of a setting to study line length perception, right? And you don't use that length that type of a study to evaluate your technology because it's going to be subject to social pressures. Mm -hmm. And when you have a room full of people with different status, then you've really got a mess. Now, there might be reasons to run a focus group like to um, create interest in a community. So you bring them all in and you show them your new stuff and you know, and they get interested in it, but it's not a measure. That's it's it's a strategy for marketing your technology for sure, but it's not going to be reported in any psychological journal as as data. Yeah, that's I'm, my decision. Very interesting thing. <laughs> so I I want to this kind of thing from different uh, perspective. So there is a, a con, you know concept called Harvard pluralism. So the idea is Harvard psychologists they tried this in 1950s. So the idea is let's say there is a so 9 a.m. in the morning and there's a junction which is very busy they start putting people looking up <laughs> so just, you know you put one people looking up yeah. two people looking up mm. once the size become 10 mm. the whole traffic stops mm -hmm. so everybody's wrong oh, <laughs> okay. so that's that's the concept of hyper pluralism so we have we have studied looking at you know social media so let's say you know let's say we, we all know trump is bad guy listen but let's say you open up tomorrow and you were looking at social media and see everybody's talking positive about Trump. <laughs> Somehow, you know, you know, everybody's, you know, Trump is a good guy, he changed, you know, blah, blah, all this. 
So you want to yeah, give me, right? <laughs> yeah. So we have seen that this is a snowball effect. Yeah. And it, it creates, you know, a lot of people, you know, jump into that. Scene. Right. Also, you know, support this. And so, and I think to make a really important point regarding social media hmm. and the prevalence of a certain viewpoint on social media. Hmm. So we're very attuned to the frequency effects. Hmm. And that's a real problem for predicting and controlling human behavior <laughs> as, as one of the mechanisms. So it's not that I'm against group dynamics or I think it's a bad thing or anything like that. It's just that you're not studying my life. <laughs> yeah. Like I still don't understand. Isn't that a bad thing? Like a, uh, doesn't that deprive of actual effort? Like what is the actual effort? Well, okay, so that's that other topic that I said I'm not going to talk of the isms, the isms, okay, um, and uh, you, to address that problem, like what is truth and all that, we have to. <laughs> okay, so I have a better. So we know that human beings, you know, do these things, right? Social pressure, etc. So now it's on the person how you're using. If you look at Cambridge Analytica videos very carefully, yeah. I can send you things. They know this hyper pluralism exists. So they reverse engineer it. How? Okay, now they have find out, okay, these are Trump followers, these are Clinton followers. Now there are middle group who are not very sure. Now they targeted those people and every day they create a lot of things to show, hey, Hillary is better, Hillary is better, Hillary. So you're actually kind of, you know, using this to, you know, Kind of you know, uh, polarize them towards something. Mm. So they use it for wrong purpose. You can use it for better purpose. That's how you're using it. Of course, who defines what a good purpose is? But you know, but okay, you, your your point is well taken. Um, and I would just there are certainly experimental methods that are designed to address the perception of line length. And I already made the point to you that there is a dissociation between the physical metrics that we might use. I gave you the example in sound, but it would work in any other uh, perceptual domain as well. Um, there is a dissociation between the physical metric and human experience. I mean, that's just, that's part of what it is to be human. And that really is sort of the nub of the problem problem of you know like what is truth is it is it what is measurable by a certain set of scientific instruments or is it what is functional from a human perspective what is useful from a human perspective so i can't i can't solve that problem but i can tell you that it is a, an important problem okay so so if you're doing focus groups you're not collecting data about the effectiveness of your tools. And I really want to make sure you understand that. Okay, now, that is not to say that there is no such thing as legitimate scholarly research outside of a laboratory setting. Um, and that you might even do in a, a group setting. I'm not saying it's not possible to do that. I'm just saying you want to be careful about what it is that you're doing. And so let me very quickly introduce you to some qualitative and descriptive research methods that you might come across uh, either in working with your clinicians, you will come across some of this for sure. Uh, and when you do a lot of uh, natural language and conversation analysis work, you'll, you'll wander into this territory. So one of them, um, surveys which I want to make sure we have a little bit of insight into. They are used for social and personality research. They're rather less common in cognitive science. Certainly surveys are used in like a clinical environment. So, you know, the, I think there's a, there's, there's test items that you guys use that what's that called picture naming task or something. Yeah. Um, so there, there, and, and then there are other things that people use you know, uh, asking questions of the participant and, pardon me? A video question. Yeah, right. So, so these things certainly exist. Um, but I want to, I want to emphasize that the results that you get are very, 
very influenced by the task that you give people and the items that you provide. And it is really easy to sway responses based on the, the idiosyncrasies, the unexpected pieces of, of influence in your item wording or in your task that we really have to be worried about. And I don't worry about this, but there's a whole group of people who just worry about this kind of problem. And in particular, there are elaborate quantitative methods for selecting the items that should be on a survey, for, for scrubbing the wording, for looking at the response scale. It's really quite intricate. Um, my advice to you, if you're gonna go in this survey direction and you need, you need one and there isn't one already available, go look for one in the literature because you don't wanna be in a situation where you have to defend your survey and the items on your survey. It's just, it's, it's, it's going to be above our pay scales. Um, when you're doing a survey, and some of you might want to be doing a survey in evaluating your systems, for example. One of the things that you really have to worry about is this phenomenon called careless responding. So you get a survey of you know, 20 questions and it might be okay, 30 questions and people are going to start randomly checking off crap. And so you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and you know, if you need to go here and you can't get one in the literature, there isn't something that's already validated, Go get someone to help you. Um, Heng Tao in education is perfectly qualified to help you with this problem. I have oh, a yeah. uh, about this item thing. So these items are included on the basis that all regions have been considered to be analyzed. And there are, I sorry I modified this. There are aggregation questions and weighting questions. Like, so how many items do you include that test this region versus that region? And should the weighting of importance be a function of how many items you included? I thought I changed this. I guess it just didn't get it uploaded. So what I, the point that I wanted to make to you guys is that you've heard me be, many of you have heard me be suspicious about these kinds of clinical surveys and questionnaires before and, and clinical tests. And what and, and the reason I'm suspicious is because I'm not feeling like they've done the psychometric, that's the technical term, psychometric analysis on the items and, and, and the scoring system in the way that they should. And this is why I tell you, look at the subscales because there's assumptions and this has come up in our project. Yeah. There are assumptions in the aggregation of test items that might not be very sound. And now there's a trade-off here because once you sort of descend into the subscales, well, now you're chasing more predictors and you've got some statistical issues to worry about. But I, I'm, I'm very suspicious of this. When Amit talks about this, he's like, well, but that's all that they have. And I'm like, well, that's that that might be all that they have, but I think we can do better. <laughs> I think we need to look at this a little bit more closely. Okay, um, qualitative and descriptive research also includes something like conversation analysis. And this is not the same thing as setting up a focus group to talk about your wonderful whiz bang tool. This is people doing real work in their natural environment, <laughs> responding to each other and not so much you. You might be there. Uh, you might be in a situation where you are uh, obtaining recordings and so you're not there at all. There is a huge concern in this kind of a situation for your influence on the work behavior. So when I was at NASA, for example, I was there for almost 10 years. Actually, I, I, I don't know, something like 10 years. Um, and, and I became just a regular fixture in the situation. And, and certainly when I've been in a surgical setting, when I've been in the emergency room, when I've been at a control room at NASA, I promise you Nobody gives a damn what Valerie thinks about their behavior. They are much more worried about accomplishing their 
their task. And so I'm not so concerned about my influence on the data that I'm gathering. Um, you can learn a ton of things from how people talk to each other. You can learn about turn-taking conventions. You can learn how people shape their message for a particular recipient. Uh, you can learn about sort of the structure of conversation, uh, asking a question and then getting an answer. You can learn about the selection of lexical items. There's a phenomenon called lexical alignment where I'll use a word and you need to refer to the same concept, you'll use the same word. Um, you, you establish ways of referring to objects. So, you know, that particular table with the water bottle, even though it has the speaker on it, we might come to agree that we're going to talk about that table with the one with the water bottle on it or the small one or whatever. We're going to come to an agreement about how we're going to refer to that kind of thing. Um, you learn that there is information in um, tone of voice. So is that, is that the small table? Okay, so, you know, I'm raising a question. I'm expecting you to confirm that. Um, grounding, again, you know, how our terms are going to map on to features in the environment. Um, Dyxis, uh, these are terms that only make sense in, in a particular concept uh, context. So I can say that table, the meaning of that depends on, if I say that table, you know, I'm looking at this one here. If I say that table, you know that the that matches this table here, <laughs> this. Um, acknowledgement, um, so I'll say something and I'll be looking at you guys while I'm talking to see if you seem to be tracking or if you know, you're looking at your laptops or your phones or whatever uh, to make sure that I'm saying something that makes sense to you. Uh, there's interesting findings related to articles, which I know is really difficult for this audience, but there is a difference between a cat and the cat. Um, a cat means any random cat. The cat means a cat that we've been talking about before. There are conventions on how people use those. I know that's difficult because in the native languages that you speak, um, that distinction isn't there. Uh, indirect speech acts, uh, I might say something like, uh, can you uh, pass me that cup? And I'm not asking literally whether or not you can pass me that cup. I am asking you to pass the cup. Um, uh, modals, um, attitudes, um, and could, would, should, these are all different ways of expressing uh, intent and requests that have meaningful differences. Uh, gesture is something that occurs in conversation analysis. So. You know, all of this stuff that I have identified here it would certainly be included in any scholarly analysis of natural language from a sort of broader cognitive science perspective. If I were in charge of alleviate, and I were worried about making it more acceptable to a patient or uh, seem more natural, I'd be worried about audience design. I'd be really worried about audience design and how we adapt what the, what the, the system says or queries in response to the language that the patient is using. So in this, this is a sense in which personalization does take a place in cognitive science, but it's not sort of like personality characteristics. It's more like, who is this person? What have they just been talking about? What is their context? Um, what language have they just been using? Those are the, uh, the features of human behavior that I would want my chatbot to be adapting to. And then there's um, a ton of of problems in the implementation of all this other stuff, which, you know, again, if I were doing, if I were doing alleviate, I'd look at all of this <laughs> to get that right. And, and much of this um, concerns an issue not of meaning of language, but the 
function of language, how we use language to do things. And that whole notion is called pragmatics. Okay, one other uh, uh, well-respected uh, qualitative method is anthropological methods. Uh, and this would include situated observation and participant observation. That's what I'm doing when I'm in the emergency room or at NASA Mission Control. Um, there is a, a compensatory alternative. I don't like it, but sometimes we have to use it. And that is an interview method where you sit down with an expert and ask them questions. Your best bet if you are in that kind of situation is to reinstate the context in which they were making some kind of decision. So tell me about that really difficult appendectomy. You know, what was going on in that situation rather than sort of general comments about how to do an appendectomy. You're much more likely to get substantive content out. And that method's called a critical incident method for uh, constructing an interview. Um, but I do want to make it clear that this is, not an unconstrained set of methods here when you're doing either situated observation or interviews. It is not the case that anything goes, that anybody can just sit down and get data from talking to somebody. Um, there are methods having to do with how you code the data. There are concerns about um, confirming your conclusions that you collected in one context with the conclusions that you make in another context, that's called triangulation. You are obliged to follow something called saturation where you keep on observing, you keep on interviewing until you don't find anything new. Uh, and you do need to be concerned about iterator reliability, which means that you know, I look at the data and I see it one way, you look at the data and you see it another way. So, you know, this, this idea that like we're all people and we can like, all just go out and talk to other people and figure out what they're doing. No, that is not consistent with scholarly methods that, that are in this tradition. Um, in my lab, lots of us are working towards automated coding um, with, with some kind of framework for doing that coding. Um, you know, you might call this feature engineering. Um, I, I like to use automated coding when I can, not because it eliminates bias, it doesn't, but it does make the biases explicit. So you know, if you can automate it, you, the biases are built into your process and they are therefore inspectable. Uh, we don't have to do iterator reliability. And um, this is the way I think about our social media analysis stuff. It is automated coding. What's Triangulation means you observe a phenomenon in one setting and you go to a completely different setting to observe it and you see the same thing. Uh, for example, we got, we got dinged on this, so I'll tell you where. Uh, we were able to satisfy it. Um, we had one set of conclusions about how doctors and patients interact in a neurology clinic and we confirmed those conclusions in the context of doctor-patient interaction in the emergency department. Same issue. And the issue at stake in that particular case was that patients are contributing to diagnostic reasoning. So there's this sort of model of physicians that, you know, that they do all the work and they're the smart guys and you know, they, they come up with the solutions, but really, there's a strong interaction between what the patient says and what the, what the doctor says. So does that help? Two, yeah, two settings. I understand the word. Oh, try, triangulate. Like, yeah. like a triangle. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, they all, all the points converge. Uh. That's what it's called. Oh. Okay, where are we? What time is it? My God, how many pages? Two, two. Two, okay, good. That's better than I thought. Um, so that's a really quick tour on, you know, how cognitive scientists in general collect data about human performance a little bit. You know, when we went to the natural language piece, a little bit about what kinds of conclusions they can make. I obviously don't have an opportunity to go into every, you know, detail <laughs> on how we, 
collect data and how we make inferences, but this gives you a mindset for understanding how somebody like Amit Almar would think about things and we will be working with Amit and he will absolutely, I promise you, be working, be thinking about deception in terms of an experiment. Uh, when I've interacted with Brent Strickland, I don't know if you hear what Brent, well, when I've interacted with Brent, same thing. So, you know, you're going to have to, you're, you're not going to overcome that. That's part of the culture. And so we have to figure out how, how to work the bridge. within that. Yeah. Okay. So um, now I want to spend some time going into the individual components in a computational cognitive model because I think it makes, it, it sort of touches or integrates nicely um, Ahmet's uh, perception, semantic cognition framework for thinking about, about computation. And so I wanna give you some insights into how cognitive science thinks about similar issues. Okay, so, the perceptual system I would associate with Kahneman system one, and Ahmed's talked about that before with you guys, right? Um, and I already made the point that Newell delegated the perceptual system to a special uh, domain of inquiry. Um, and, and the idea was that, you know, whatever it is that we're doing perceptually, it deposits <laughs> symbols in our heads and the reasoning, the real work is in the head with respect to those symbols. Um, and and the, the real problem there is that it does appear to be the case that our knowledge, our higher order experiences and cognition does seem to reach down into our perceptual processes. And so this, this uh, partition, of inquiry is really coming under under threat. Um, but I, I do want to make the point that there are bottom up influences, and I've made this point before, but I, but I want to make sure it's clear. Um, there are bottom up influences on our ability to detect things in the environment. Um, so I already talk to you about how we're differentially sensitive to different frequencies of sound. I didn't make the point about light, uh, but the same thing holds. Um, and what I have here is a projection, not of our visual and auditory systems on the brain, but our sense of touch on the brain. And the point that I want to make here, have you guys seen this before, this figure before? No. No? <laughs> not even you? You have. Okay. So um, this is a projection of the representation of our sensory systems, our tactile sensory system on the brain. And so what you can see is there's, you know, a whole lot of representation on the hand. And yeah, now you're looking at your hands going, wow, really? <laughs> Tongue, mouth, right? A lot of reasons you need that. You need that for speech, and you also need that for eating, right? Um, you know, not so much on the toes, and you certainly you're going to have more real estate in your brain devoted to sensation from your hands than you are from your feet. So this is just another example of how our cognitive architecture is influencing our ability to interact with the environment. And so it's built in, it's built in in the sensors themselves and it's built in into the brain. So this is part of the brain? Yeah, well, this is a part of the brain. This is a slice, yeah, that's the I'm sensory uh, so cortex. Senses are like just for a part of brain, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. well, this is, this is one of the points that we were making before when we did the neuroscience piece mm -hmm. and I said, um, one of the things that really disturbs me about your deep learning models, and even Chomsky made this point as well, is that you are very, very caught up in the mechanics of the neuron, and you're not thinking about the um, structure, structure yeah. in, in, inside the brain, and different areas do different things. Yeah. 
So all the senses are like part of slice of the brain, according. To uh, I don't know, Savannah. Do you know? Do you know about the auditory cortex and how that works? I mean, it's in a different place, obviously. Um, and and then the vision projects to the occipital lobes. So I, I don't. I don't know that this is not my area of expertise at all. Um, but I, I just want to make the point that there are different structures in the brain so, that do like, these jobs. Like the occipital, temporal, occipital, preoccipital, and thalamus is in the between. So this is from uh, sensory. Uh, yeah, sensory. So this is around here. Yeah, it's yeah, right here. Around back. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, just so you know, the left and the right aren't the same either. Yeah. The, the left and the right have different capabilities. So our right hand will reflect the left part of the brain and left will reflect the right part of the brain. Yeah. It's opposite than the brain. So again, you know, if you're if you're interested in predicting and controlling behavior with neuroscience models, the architecture of the brain is going to be really, really important. Okay, um, so I do want to make some points about perception that might surprise you. Um, one of them is a phenomenon that I know when I pointed this out to Ravathi, it like blew her mind. Um, so we'll talk about texture gradients. We're gonna talk about the fact that there is information in motion. Um, we'll do both of those. So let's see, let's do the texture. Uh, that's not what I wanted. There, these are out of order. Here's a texture gradient image. And the idea is that things that are up close to you have a very, uh, gross appearance and things in the distance have this really fine grained appearance. And the reason this is so important from a psychological perspective is that prior to this observation, which comes from Jim Gibson, we had this notion that depth perception was a function of the convergence of your two eyes. And Gibson's point was you don't need convergence of the eyes to do depth perception. There's plenty of information about distance in the texture gradient in the, in the world. Uh, let's do the information in motion. Here the point is that much of the cognitive work or the, the experimental work, let me put it that way, much of the experimental work has on, on perception has, yeah, that's the one, has, just one second, has partitioned perceptual processes from motion processes. And the idea was, and motion analysis processes, and the idea was, first, let's understand how we deal with static images. Surely that's simpler. Then we'll worry about how we deal with moving images because after all, you know, there's perspective changes and all that that you have to worry about when, when you're dealing with, with motion. And the point of this work and, and the work that Amit cites with NICER, although not as well as I'd like, the NICER perspective, the point is that there is information in the motion that contributes to your perception. So let's look at this. Space. Hit the space button. Pardon me? Space yes. button. Space button. Hit the space button. No, not now. How about here? There we go. Old, 1971. No sound. Huh? Sound. Yeah. There, I, I don't think uh, there should be sound eventually. Yeah, there, there is. Because I hear this static or some parts of it.
gets better. Biggest surprise. <laughs> it, it, it gets better. <laughs> it's a fun video. Now what have we got? <laughs> Somebody's walking, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like as soon as you figure out that there could be a human being attached to those yep. of dots, you immediately can perceive the action. So the point here is that this that we can stop this part the, is that studying perception using static image might be a misleading and impoverished way of understanding the perceptual system. And to be honest with you, we do more of this kind of stuff in our everyday interactions with the world than we do reading or even conversing. We are always worrying about that kind of problem, where things are, how we should move through the environment, 
how we can reach things, etc. That is going to be a really central feature of, of cognition and, and behavior and living. Um, now, I do want to make the point that studying representations is not the same thing as, what time is it? I, I, I do. Okay, good. Is not the same thing as studying natural perception. And I don't know why things got out of this order here, but okay. I don't need a citation for this. I was there. Um, this is a first shot that we got from the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity. This is the second day, that's called SOL 2. We landed here, we got this picture back, and we thought, oh my God, we are in a crater. How are we going to get out of this crater? And this is what is in our notes. The latest pictures from Opportunity reveal a better detail the striped and cracked layers of rock in the outcropping of bedrock, just 26 feet, about eight meters away from where the second Mer rover, that's opportunity, came to stop. The outcrop at first glimpse appeared to be rather large and imposing, and that's why we called it the Great Wall, something that initially concerned engineers who wondered about opportunity's ability to navigate up and over around them. So look at that tight relationship between the perception and what kinds of actions would be feasible in that kind of environment. Uh, but as the pictures continue to stream in, they discovered that the outcrop was composed of tiny rocks. As lead scientist Steve Squires described them, the thinnest layers we're, we're seeing are a centimeter, the thickness of your finger. So they are very small features, Squires said. The highest point is a foot, that means this will be significantly less threatening to the rover. So again, that coupling of perception and, and action. But then here's the question. Why did we make this mistake? Why did we think we were in a big ditch? Here's why. The assumption in an image is that the camera height is at human eye height. And so what we saw looked to be, if it were at our eye height, really high. But the camera was actually like way down here. <laughs> and more, we were more than able to overcome you know, that with the rover's capability. So this is a really nice example of this trend towards embodied cognition, where you start thinking about what kinds of actions you can execute in the world as a function of your own effectors and your own motor system. And this kind of insight has really been ignored up until fairly recently with that Barcelou trend. Um, that has been ignored in our conceptualization of cognition and, and reasoning. And that's a problem. And I do believe we're going to have to deal with this influence on our thinking processes in a substantive way. Um, what's particularly interesting about this example uh, is that we had exactly the same problem. I wasn't there, but we had exactly the same problem on a previous mission called Pathfinder and they also misestimated the height of a rock for the, exactly the same reason. So we didn't learn. <laughs> okay, motor system. Time still okay? Yes, okay. Motor Sorry. system. And you know, more of this thread of embodied cognition. We need to start thinking about how our perceptual systems and our um, um, uh, motor systems interact our behavior. Will we go back to and make one more point? That I failed to make here. So one of the lead-ins to this was looking at a picture is not the same thing as being in that physical environment. And an awful lot of perceptual research has studied picture perception. And so it's a static image. You're assuming an eye height. 
you're not able to move around in that environment, it really isn't clear what that kind of experimental work is telling you about the underlying perceptual system. Okay. The motor system. Oh no. Back to the one that perception is trainable. Uh, I love this picture. Uh, this is a, a the graphics, the figures that accompanied a famous article in like the 80s or so by Irv Biederman. And he was looking at the perceptual processes involved in determining the sex of a chicken. Why do we care about the sex of a chicken? Huh? Whether it is the eggs. Yeah. Does it live or die? Is you know, really it's a death sentence kind of thing here. It's like, okay, you're a male, you're gone. Um, <laughs> you're a female, we'll keep you. That's the poultry business. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So there's people who learn how to do this and they have, they have to make these fine brain distinctions. I think these are the males and, and these are the females. And there are people who know how to turn a chicken upside down and determine what its sex is. Of course, you know, we've carefully hidden the identity of this particular chicken to protect it. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a you know subject confidentiality kind of issue, um, but um, but uh, um, the point here is that with experience, your perceptual system does become attuned to meaningful features in the environment, and that again shows that whatever it is that's going on cognitively does reach down into your interpretation of the environment. And so Newell's, you know, separability of the cognitive components of behavior from the perceptual components of behavior are really called into question by this expertise literature. Okay, now I can make this point about the motor system. Again, you know, we saw on the Mars rover example, concern for whether or not the motor system of the rover would be capable of dealing with this kind of an environment. And this is just a little example of some work that has been done on our motor system. You know, there's just like, uh, again, you could have an entire course just on this. We used to have an expert on this. By the way, we have an expert who studies um, motion perception in our department. That's all he does, motion perception. Um, so there's tons of work on the motor system and manual control, but I just want to mention this one piece of work that is um, central in, to understanding behavior in general, but is also interesting because of its ties to the Dayton area and also Michael Posner. So the phenomenon that I want to identify for you is called Fitz Law. So if I have a target like this thing right here the for advancing the slides my the first part of my movement is going to be very, very fast very fast and as i approach the target it's going to slow down and that the function that guides that movement is called fitz law and paul fitz did the majority of his work at wright patterson air force base in dayton ohio posner Michael Posner, whom you heard from before, was one of his most famous mentees. The fact that Fitz did this and similar work in the Dayton area and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is why there is so much human factors expertise concentrated in Dayton. That is why our department is there really tethered to um, uh, the Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And there is a building, gosh, Savannah, I hope it's still called the Fitz Building. Is there still a Fitz Building? I'm not sure. I'm assuming. I I, oh, yeah, yeah, there is. Okay. Yeah, Paul Fitz Engineering Laboratory. Okay, good. And when you go into the lobby, you'll see all kinds of wonderful pictures of Paul Fitz and all of the work, work that he did. Um, now, interestingly enough, subsequent work on this determined that we really needed to refine the equation according to the size of not just 
the target pointer. So you need to, if you're trying to hit something with your toe or your foot, that's gonna be a little bit different than trying to hit something with your finger. So again, the nature of our bodies is determining our action and our planning processes. And so that's just another twist on this notion of embodied cognition. You just really can't separate out behavior from our perceptual and motor processes. Uh, Zach went on uh, much later to make a distinction between reasoning about acts with the hands versus acts with our feet. So if I want to get that cup right over there, you guys already know, you can predict what's gonna happen here. The first thing that's gonna happen is an act with my feet. And the next thing that's gonna happen is an act with my hand. Why? Because my arm isn't long enough to reach that cup from this particular position. So this kind of distinction between um, what we can do with our feet, the affordances, if you will, of what we can do with our feet and what we can do with our hands really does affect our behavior and our ability to predict other people's behavior. Okay, so all of this to say that really, really, it's not, not making a whole lot of sense to completely partition the cognitive system from the perceptual and motor system. And certainly nicer, whom Ahmed has cited for you before. You've seen this figure before, right? Everybody has seen this figure before? No? Gosh, well, Ahmed talks about nicer all the time. So, so there's the actual world, um, which is, is interpreted by a cognitive system which directs locomotion and action and samples the actual world. So the whole thing is an integrated piece and it's not just a question of having an isolated cognitive module. Now I suggested to you before that I'm a little unhappy with the nicer uh, model. And the reason I'm unhappy with the nicer model is that more happens here than just sampling the actual world. When we move and behave in the physical world, we are actually changing the world. And I'm going to use this example precisely. I'm going to pick up this speaker and I'm going to move it, okay? So what was once true before I performed that action is no longer true after the action. And reasoning somehow needs to keep track of that process. And that was not very well anticipated here. Although, you know, nevertheless, um, the achievement of integrating in perception, cognition, and, and action was an important step at, at the time. And that was 1976. And uh, so I've given you these sort of like placeholders for worldviews in cognitive science. Another placeholder would be Cornell. Uh, Cornell in Ithaca, New York. And Cornell is the site of what is known as ecological psychology, meaning taking into account the integration of human behavior with the ecological environment. And, the, and two of the most famous people associated with that would be Jimmy Gibson, who did the work on the texture gradients that I showed you. Uh, and then Ulrich Neisser, who was at the psych department at the time that Jimmy Gibson was thinking about how to integrate in that whole uh, notion with cognition. Now, where are we? 231. 231, okay. So when we come back, We'll talk about long-term memory. We're going to segment it into semantic and episodic pieces. There'll be a piece in, of, of um, interesting stuff in here about, about personalization in terms of knowledge and experience. And then we're going to specifically call out procedural memory. And it's the procedural memory and the, the cognition associated with planning and reasoning about actions and their effect on the world that I view as the most um, 
novel, that's not a nice way to put it, <laughs> novel for you guys. You really have not been exposed to this kind of issue in human reasoning in the way that I think you need to in order to sort of have a good picture. And that's all we're going to do today. Okay. Oh gosh, okay. Ooh, chat. Oh my gosh. Let's see what we got. Oh yeah, okay. I've been answering the chat. Okay. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Yes, uh, so the yes, um genetics that you Chomsky. <laughs> so, but it has to do with how you define language. We can talk about that. Where, how much scroll down? Is what happens during experimentation in online settings? Big problem, Kaushik. You absolutely have to be worried about the context of data collection, and it often hoses your um, your conclusions. We've had problems with that. Can't hear the video. Oh, I, do I need to resend it? Patrick, don't tell me. Uh, is empathy and um, uh, style? I, I would probably look, look that into audience design. Yeah. Uh, exploration versus exploitation. I'm not sure what that was um, associated with. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, I just had a curiosity mm -hmm. question. So, when cognitive scientists or psychologists perform experiments on um, human behavior, um, do they all 